Hey all, welcome to the third edition of Amnik Cast. Today we have Abhishek Gaurav. Uh, I had a chance to talk to him before. I think uh, he has had an amazing journey from starting his career as a developer to now he heads DevOps at uh, Greatip. So we will actually have a perspective from him in terms of on-prem, uh, cloud strategies, and then reliability, performance, as well as cost optimization. Welcome Abhishek. So why don't you give uh, your uh, introduction to the viewers in terms of your own journey? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Satya, for the introduction and thanks for having me. It's really nice to speak to you and it's a really good platform where we can share our journey, our experience, and, and it will give a, a nice perspective for, for the audience to the audience. And uh, they can also learn from our experience and they can do better. Uh, talking about me, I'm just uh, I'm working as a head of DevOps at, uh, at Great Ape uh, and my journey so far was a really nice and also i will say solar code right i have i've worked for many many companies i've i've been a, a consultant where i was consulting to many other companies and and building their infrastructure um, bringing the devops best practices handling the scale at hotstar it, it was a bigger one at mpl it was a really bigger one working in aiml uh, industry as well my previous stint was in completely the company was in aiml and we were building aiml since last two companies, this and the previous one, I was also not just handling the uh, the cloud bit, but uh, we managed to build a, a hybrid cloud. I mean, on-prem and then multi-cloud strategy, which I think is now the trend in the DevOps, and everybody wants to go there. They want to. They don't want to stick with one one cloud. So yeah, it, it was an amazing journey, and and I'm like really glad to be here and share my experience with you and with the audience. Awesome, awesome, Abhishek. Let's start off with the hybrid and the multi-cloud strategy, right? It's pretty unique because like last two sessions we had a lot on cloud. How do you think about a hybrid cloud, and where do you start? Like where do you figure out like a hey, hybrid works versus uh, like a, a on-prem works versus cloud works, or when do I have to go to multi-cloud? I mean, uh, generally, there are two aspects of it when we select any strategy. Obviously, the main aspect is the business. There has to be a business need. And we, as a technical person, we need to enable business to you know, grow and, and, and to have a multiple way of, of, of doing things. That, and that is the one. Second one is, again, technical. Uh, with my experience, I will tell you from the previous experience on this, what if my business needs because they're dealing with some customer and they they have some specific need on being on one particular uh, cloud. Uh, what if I'm dealing with US government and the US government, you know, they, they don't deal with any normal cloud, but they have a very specific need of having an AWS Gov cloud. You have to be there to, to be compliant until unless me as a technical enabling, uh, my business will not grow. So it's a business need. And then there is a technical need. What if my technical, my engineering teams need to explore some of the services which is available in only that particular cloud and, and it's not in AWS or GCP. It could be somewhere, it, it could be only in AWS and not in GCP and all. If I'm sticking with one cloud, uh, definitely uh, they want my engineering, uh, I won't be enabling my engineering to explore the new tools and technology which is there available in the market maybe not in the cloud where I'm working, but but in the in the open cloud. So again, my job as a, as a DevOps is to enable the business so their business will go smoothly. Uh, I need to give them some levers where they can play with the businesses, for example, uh, on-prem or, 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 or some particular cloud. Um, I'm also giving them an option to choose between whenever they want, they're going and doing some business dealing. For example, you know, if I'm in AWS and GCP, I will give you a better deal if you come to me. So straight away 10% of discount or something. So I need to enable them to, to make such decisions. And then I'm enabling my engineering uh, team to, you know, explore all the possible tools and technology available in whatsoever, in whatever the market or whatever the cloud. So yes, that, so when I decide, I, I keep these aspects in my mind and then we take, make a decision. Um, one other aspect is nowadays now, uh, I, I think many of the company, they also started moving towards multi-cloud strategy. 
on prem is again a different one and we'll get there in the on prem but the multi cloud strategy is okay nobody wants to stick to one particular vendor the vendor locking we always say we always talk about it we 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 may implement in, in all other way but we do not do it in the when we talk about the infrastructure we do not do it uh, there there's so many aspect why we do not do it uh, but it's a big in business need i don't want to be a vendor locked i want to be open uh, I, i want to be my engineering has to be open so it can it can go from what uh, in any any given cloud whenever business need or whenever there, there is any need it's because of the high availability also for disaster management also if you talk about any of these devops practices now this becomes a need of an hour where we need to be in the multi cloud also that's pretty amazing right like you have got uh, on prem multi cloud right can you just give us a walk through of like what goes behind this how did you enable your business team or your technology team to be able to adapt to that kind of environment right what goes into building the devops in actually setting it up for that because a lot of companies want to get that uh, it'll be great to understand like how did you get there hmm so yeah it, it's not e- easy and that's why not everybody is doing it um, yeah. it, it involves i i when i divide i involve three different part uh, three different in the technology wise one is a complete infrastructure when you go with different different cloud there will be different experience their services will be different yeah. now your your engineering your development need to be designed or architect in such a way it it can support all of the given environments just for example just uh, uh, for object storage in aws we have s3 in gcp we have gcs in the on prem we have something else if your code is calling s3 api then it will mm-hmm. be really if you go to the diff- different different cloud uh, you have to make those changes and those changes will be really costly one because you have to code change itself is a costly one and then you have to make a choice when to run what will be costly instead of doing it we have an open source called minio if you start interacting with the minio minio interact with whatever object storage you configure with then no matter if you're deploying into the gcp or aws on on prem uh, there is no code change involved one single artifact can be deployed in any given cloud that is the architectural changes you need to do the second is you know you need to also choose that whatever your tools and technology the platform you are using has to be available everywhere for example i generally now in the kubernetes world in the in the, the uh, dockers and container world now everybody is behind it if you for example if you choose only ecs which is aws specific uh, uh, container engine if you design all your manifest your deployment file according to the ecs which is in json format you are vendor locked and you won't be able to deploy that in anywhere else without having a complete separate things so when you choose kubernetes which is available open source which is available in all given cloud then you are becoming cloud agnostic and your your uh, your artifact or the services which is running in one place can run into multiple places into multiple clouds uh, yes there are some few tweaks but yeah 90% of the time you know it it reduces your overall burden then comes your deployment strategy how do you deploy when you go to the different different clouds because authorization authentication and these things changes even yeah. though you are in kubernetes you, the way you uh, connect to the eks cluster the way you connect to the gke cluster is completely different and the way you connect to your on prem would be completely yeah. different so you need to be uh, cautious about and design a deployment strategy in such a way it, it, it can handle all the scenarios and finally the observability piece where you know you also need to choose if you're just relying on uh, for example cloud watch for your monitoring uses definitely you won't be able to support your dke on prem so being a cloud agnostic and choosing this cloud agnostic starting from you know changing your architecture of your services which is ready for the multiple uh, or hybrid deployments that's a big strategy and whenever i have to start i start from uh, correcting or uh, improving my uh, architecture uh, and then while i am doing those changes in the architecture i keep my platform ready so whenever my code and, uh, and everything is ready it's ready to be deployed my platform is ready and it will be uh, deployed and 
yeah uh, then that's how we plan and that's how we achieve the hybrid or multi cloud strategy awesome i actually actually you touched upon pretty much everything in terms of uh, architectural changes to deployment strategies to observability one thing that uh, how do you do the secrets part of it right um, because that again is little different from each of these cloud right? yeah uh, so two kind of secrets generally when because we are in kubernetes and then we use kubernetes secret uh, all, all for the application secrets we use kubernetes secret so no matter where you go you have that available then the roles and iam roles and authentication that is a comes from something different and it's always a pain when you start managing them into the different different cloud but there are tools which help you do it uh, again that is not very i, I won't say um, my experience with those tools are is that okay when you go with them it's not very easy not very straightforward but uh, yeah you choose the cloud agnostic tool which will manage for you for example mina you is doing for the s3 um okay. uh, you have different tool for handling my secret so choose a right. tool correctly choose automation and then uh, you can achieve it got it got it i think uh, so moving on to the next set of stuff right uh, you have been you have been the first devops engineer in companies and you have scaled it like so why don't we talk about reliability aspects of it like when you talk about like uh, take us through a place where you built it with reliability in the mind and what are all uh, the steps that went into actually making it happen hmm it's a really great question that's ex- exactly not directly impacting the business but that that's where i'm directly connecting and improving my user experience which is the core of any business you uh, and, and i still we say your customer is a god if you are giving them a nice uh, interface nice experience you can grow your business so uh, when my ob- my observability or reliability of my system uh, it, it, it's not uptime is not great definitely it's going to give a really poor experience to my uh users starting with an experience i would say that was a really huge win and it was not even from the user experience uh, generally devops for the devops my customers are developers i build for them generally i build and automate and then i hand over to them that's what the devops means i i am automating my operations and doing all the tooling and asking devops to, uh, the developer to take care of it so they can now writing the infrastructure code they are writing the pipelines because that is also in part of their repository infrastructure as a code as a terraform is also in their repository so they are modifying they are building the ci cd pipeline observability is also as a part of the code which is there in their repository they have to do so when i'm talking about that experience of like my customers are developers one a uh, particular case I, i remember how that that's what driven and give you the nice idea how the observability and uptime is important in my pre- one of the previous company my qa uh environment was having 20 25 hours downtime every month wow. i had 80 qa now multiply 80 people salary into t- uh, per hour into 25 hours Mm-hmm. how big impact and everybody was waiting it's not easy. that that, mm-hmm. that is a straight away uh, calculation and there will be a domino effect where yeah. because qa is on hold and there are many people everybody is on hold and they are not able to do and it was a really big one so we, i have to now start thinking okay, i need to build it for the reliability and that is a must and this is what the business lever it is you know creating and we started capturing uh all the issues why why that there is a problem in the qa and we started with the rca so even in the production and everywhere whenever i have to improve the reliability of my system i always take this route of rca uh follow up with my tpm who's taking care of like all the jira ticket created from the rca whatever our learning is to have the long term fixes and short term fixes and all but that has to be you know follow rigorously otherwise if you take it you can yeah. see people generally they they start but they forget <laughs> when yeah. when there is some improvement 
but the improvement I'm talking about here, just within a month, because there was a weekly RCA happening on this only particular QA environment, and we started learning and started improving. And th there was frankly only only some process improvement what we have done. Uh, people are deploying. If somebody is deploy, somebody else is deploying, and the there's so many multiple builds are going at the same time, which is making my system crash. And because of one people's mistake, the whole uh, company is waiting and it's really hard to pinpoint which deployment is causing that issue. We just had to simply, you know, correct our pipeline. And from 25 hours a month, we reduce it to three hours just in a month by following up this, mm -hmm. yeah, starting like thinking what can be done and what the best part is again, the collaboration where we had a buy-in from all stakeholders, not from the QA, from the business, from the developer, everybody has a buy-in because they all understood, okay, this is a really big problem and this is creating a really big impact. So we all need to be there and we all need to support to make it happen. Yeah, of course, the driving uh, factor was the uh, driving team was the DevOps, but we got a support from everywhere. So that's a impact just in the QA system. Now imagine your production system where uh, you, you are directly interacting with your customer. If your customer is facing uh, five minutes of downtime, uh, definitely he's, it, it, it will hamper or impact your revenue, direct business revenue directly. So we always need to learn from our mistake. We, we never think like mistake cannot be done. It's perfectly fine. What not fine is whether you are learning from your mistake or not, or uh, how many times you are repeating your mistakes. And those has to be in a process, which is the RC, I think, is the best otherwise you know the observability the alertings the on-call rotation that is all all there to to firefight but we always try to reduce it by making this rc process got it awesome uh let's go into the cost part of it right i know we have discussed few things where uh you are able to actually uh change your log management and did quite a few things in that right wanted to talk about like uh, let's talk about observability with respect to cost panel like uh, logging and then we can go into cost itself yeah yeah sure so when we talk about cost uh, again from why we even speak about cost infrastructure cost if you start calculating your business and start calculating your cm labels i think it comes in cm2 it's the biggest cost for any any company who are into technical business per month i i think around 10% of the business cost is going into the infrastructure. So it's a big factor. That's why we always have to be mindful. When we start it, it doesn't look, it looks really small, but as my company grows, this infrastructure goes, uh, uh, grows exponentially. Starting with, with very, very smaller one, uh, somebody, some group of two, two or three group of uh, the people, they started uh, a startup, they started a company, I mean, not in a full phase, not in the register way, but there was thinking and doing some POC and all. They came to me and asking for uh, just a suggestion, okay, how should we start our uh, infrastructure journey? Their spend was 15,000 rupees per month at that time, and they were just deploying in the VM and all. It's a very simple one, you know, at that point of time, they did not even have a concern about the cost and all, but only because they're, they're not thinking from that cost perspective, they were not thinking long term. I know for sure with that mindset and with that sector, what they are doing, the, the, the moment they will go live, uh, their infrastructure cost will be, will be bloated and it will squeeze their uh, earning. The, so so then we did with some some basic stuff. We did Kubernetes. We went with the spot and all. And their per month cloud cost uh, became two thousand rupees per month. That's all. Uh, but but it, it created a process which in the long term, no matter how much scale they will do, they will be. I mean, they won't be bloating their things. So again, that was a story. Coming back to how do we manage cost is. It's a really big impact on the business because it's a huge, huge in infrastructure cost, no matter you're on on-prem or, or, or you're in GCP, AWS, Azure. No matter whether there is an economic slowdown 
or there is a you, you know boom in the market where you can you know raise the money very easily it's always important to save your money and and not to bloat uh, and always prepare for the worst day how you can do by by being cautious about uh, your cloud spend or in 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 that matter for that matter any spend in the cloud spend the the important levers are being hygienic you know it's it, not being biased because you know you always need a a machine where you have to deploy and it, it has to run so if you're going by that rule that i just have to blindly reduce cost i don't think it works but always going with the mindset where okay you know what you're spending and you calculate your roi mm-hmm. then automatically it will be in your process and the process will take you to best uh, practices so yeah whenever we think about cloud cost optimization i generally feel that uh, the costing comes uh, at the last stage of the company where company is really think it's bloated already or they are into some financial problem where they need to now cut down the cost which i think the trend has to change and we need to think about costing and cloud costing and calculate roi from the starting from the beginning from the way where when we are building to reduce and to not get into the problem where you know many companies are currently right now i i, I still remember a quote from a, a book uh, i usually read book and there is a book called code complete i generally refer it and for the all the architects and all the calculation was when we are deciding when we are you know planning or architecting any solution if you figure it out that time versus we figure it out in the implementation there was like 50 times more costlier so we yeah. have to do it do it now and once you have implemented and already there in the production for example i have joined uh, many companies very frequently nowadays and then uh, nowadays uh, everywhere i'm i'm facing this problem of cl- cloud cost now changing the cost there would be difficult because it involves many many other levers so yes that is a very important part now uh, coming to the observability okay how i see the costing in the observability observability we cannot avoid everybody need to have the observability because it has a it has a direct impact on the customer uh, i still remember there are so many tools which will give you a really nice observability with many nice features but it comes with a cost Mm-hmm. and you need to calculate okay are you ready to spend that cost maybe for the lo- longer term yes but but for the for the short term term yes because you have some immediate need so you're going and and you know onboarding some tool for 6 months to 1 year is fine but you always has to need to have that uh, that uh, mindset that you need to replace it because over the period of time your data will increase your logging your matrices will increase and the the, the how costing happens in the observability uh, observability tool is they charge you a per, per data so you need to build a system or you need to find a system which works best for you so in my journey we recently we have you know we have a logging system we just replace it with an open source called loki and that itself was costing in one cloud 20 lakhs in another cloud 10000 i mean see what a big saving i mean just like replacing a tool from here and there but that, that but I, again i i see it's a building a open source is not an easy one nobody knows and i mean you know which configuration work for you in what situation it's really hard so that's a trade off you need to do and i i see there are so many companies i recently was talking to the ops was they they are putting all the open source together and and giving uh, giving a nice observability tool which is really cost uh, effective so that's what you need to do calculate the roi no matter it's for observability no matter for your uh, your choice of cloud no matter for what tool you are bringing calculate and always yeah keep a guard rail there in, in the in the costing side so it won't bloat in the future that's amazing i think uh, so two things like one i i like the data that you presented because uh, at amnic what we have seen is like when you come top down from hey reduce my cost you could probably reduce it by 20% 30% based on how they are right but if you actually have the thought process of building it and the architectural level like what you said it's a very different ball game right because as you start your company when you architect for that it's a very different step uh, i think your code is absolutely correct in terms of what we see on the ground that uh, when you shift left and then try it 
to make sure you are cost effective it's far more efficient than reduce the cost after thought and then you could do only as much as you can right and uh, the low key stuff is also pretty amazing that uh, we have also seen that in terms of uh, using that and at least we advocate many places where hey just use this and then try it out i think uh, great anything else that uh, comes to your mind in terms of uh, changing computes kind of stuff where you have seen hey we could optimize it in that like yeah yeah of course there are three levers which we can pull to optimize the cost one is a business lever where we go and make a choices of ris which is mm -hmm. still very i mean this also helped me like like one choice of ri one day i did and straight away saved 5 lakhs a month <laughs> so wow. that that is a business decision because you need to also be thoughtful because you are committing mm -hmm. for one year or three year maybe if you won't not consume that much still you will get built so yeah, yeah. you know you need to be cautious about ri so business decision then my decision of uh, cloud choice for example if if uh, amazon is giving me 10% enterprise discount but uh, azure will give me 20% that's where directly 10% more i can save if i can save to if my architect is is architecture or cloud uh, I mean, services are ready to be deployed in any given cloud so i can start consuming azure more and a less aws that's all i can do to save it so these are some business or i can again renegotiate my terms with the aws and cloud to you know make a better deal and get this the second is the, the in the the uh the infrastructure lever where we optimize our uh infrastructure piece which is vms and whatever we use and in the recent days because i also have to do some cloud optimization in my current company uh generally in aws you'll go and see that they always advise you to go to graviton which gives you like 30% uh mm -hmm. optimized cost and all but the problem with the with the graviton is you need to change your uh builds it has to be built in here to be deployed in graviton and it's a really hard one i mean it's not an easy one i, I tried and then even many open source solution what we use not open source all open source solution supported on arm so that again one 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 of the problem yeah, yeah, yeah. but in gcp we have n 2d machines amd which is like almost 50% cheaper than the intel one and we we have adopted started adopting n 2d and our cloud cost decreased drastically because most of our instances are running in in the kubernetes all the workloads are in kubernetes and we changed all the kubernetes instance type uh, amazing result i don't know like 15 15 15 lakhs or something we started saving by just changing this and then changing our you know, node pool inside our gke cluster is, is just like uh, like some hours of work it's not a very yeah. uh, this year your workloads are really sticky and they are sticking with one one uh, node pool and they are not or maybe they are stateful services yeah. maybe you will struggle there but yeah generally it's really easy one and then the auto auto scaling uh, you know uh, and i remember we were not in kubernetes and we were not in managed kubernetes we were running on the cops oh. that's where we were not able to scale and harness the power of the scalability which come out of box from the cloud yeah just by shifting to the eks uh, yeah we we were able to with the auto scaling which is what is given by the cloud we were managed to reduce our instance count by 50 to 80 which again gave us a really yeah. nice one so these are few things and another one which is a difficult one is architectural changes uh, i mean you know whenever you go and start setting benchmarking your application is yeah. what i generally say how to benchmark it if you go start talking to the people it has to go through the stress testing load testing and then you'll benchmark and you will see okay why the resource limit resource and limit what you're setting and why that has yeah. to be number generally people just give a random number or always in the higher side if they need 1 gb they will always put 2 gb they need one cpu they will put three cpus if you yeah, yeah, you know yeah, do yeah. the proper benchmarking you can save a lot of there but that is the hardest one because you need to be more collaborative with all the all the teams qa <laughs> all developers and everybody to yeah to do something there awesome now that you touched upon the collaboration let's come to that like uh, when we were discussing some time back one of your successful journey of how you could accomplish this is to actually have the mindset to have a collaboration 
with the team, with everyone and that, right? You touched upon a little bit earlier also, right? So why don't you give us some perspective towards like how to achieve, how to get that mindset and how do you do some of these things, right? Mm. So there is one, I prefer whenever I go there, generally I prefer to create an architectural council just to make this collaboration more in more effective way. Architect council is where I invite uh, people from each and every team who are architects to join the council. We and uh, generally a DPM who is driving it and all. Uh, but each and everything what you do, you go present to the architect council when architect council approve, and then only you go and start implementing it. It, it has many many uh, advantages. One of the advantages having a better communication or better collaboration. When I have a buy-in from the our council. Definitely, everybody will be, you know, be more uh, supportive to me. So that is one. But again, it's a really hard one to, you know, manage the decorum of the art council and council and have running all the time. I mean, again, I see uh, people are more into as you can they they are supercharged in maybe in initial days and then they forget about it and they take it more lightly and all. Then collaboration comes with trust many of the time I see when when you prove the value people will start collaborating with you more frequently uh, and how I do this is by winning the trust of the team for example I'm going to the de developer and talking to him and he's struggling with maybe deployment and maybe many of the things or he's not able to test and do something based on why but with my tools and automation maybe he do, do not know the process and all i tell him and then he becomes super happy and impressed and now whenever i have to you know i'll, I'll do some changes he will be always supportive to me and he will be collaborating he will be even he will go a step forward and then he will offer his uh, help just one simple example when i'm going with the lower level of the of the whole unit but talking about the devops which is a centerpiece of any engineering team like you know we interact with each and every everyone this is what is given that until unless i have the collaboration with each and every channel i, I won't be more effective so yeah i generally speak to each and every vertical i note down their problem their burning problem which as a devops can solve we solve it first and then we go and start changing a process. If you directly jump and you know, that, that's again a, 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 a human mindset. If you change, start, initiate any changes, the first uh, always thing is like, no, I don't want any changes. I don't like changes. I am yeah. better the way I am. <laughs> so to change it, you have to earn their respect. So I, I keep on asking everybody who works in my DevOps team or anywhere else. You know, be the devil's advocate, be, understand the, first of all, your customer, your problem. And my benefit is I come from the de uh, development background. Mm -hmm. So I know what the pain point of the developer. I, when I started my journey in the DevOps, I was also very closely working with the QA team. I, when I become into, um, I started my leadership journey, I have worked really closely with the program team and the product team and all. And now I have the whole system so i understand them i being a developer i understand what is the pain point and all so i do not go and start dictating and doing the things but i understand the pain i show the empathy with the the the, the problem what they are showing and that's how i bring a culture with the process of what i was saying is a art council and with this with this all in the place then i have a better collaborative model where you know, I uh, not just me as a DevOps, uh, the whole uh, organization harness the power of the DevOps culture. And this is what we call it DevOps culture. Yeah. And one of the examples I have already given that, you know, there was a burning business need 25 hours downtime in the QA. Yeah, yeah. We got a buy in, and that forced us to be into the collaborative situation to bring the best out of it. Awesome. We are coming towards the end of this. Like, uh... How do you want to, like, if you want to share some of your best practices, right, at overall, right, what will be those things so that the viewers will know, like, hey, these are all the things that I can have it as a key takeaway. 
so when i say devops and and many people say devops uh, how many are actually doing devops is one one of the things and i always keep on thinking because i i talk to many people i hire many people so in the interviews and all uh i see so many people are talking about devops culture but what that devops culture i mean nobody knows what the what the culture and how the things are uh, I, i would say the t- uh, key take away would be a, again what i have explained already i mean understand the the pain of your customers be customer obsessed my customers generally the the n minus 1 customers are always the the developers and the qa team so until unless you understand that that understand them understand their problems be empathetic with them you won't be able to succeed in your own things because what you are going to do as a devops as a culture is you are not going to build a things you are going to build a process and the culture and finally you are going to give it to the either qa or or to the developer you are going to empower them so now they have the not just understanding but they have the tools and technique and all the strategy to to play around with the, all the levers which they were unaware about for example infrastructure now because of the terraform they will be able to contribute into the infrastructure now because of a docker they are writing docker files so they know what what is going to be installed inside it uh, qa they now they are part of the ci cd pipeline so they know what and all how to trigger and everything they can only uh not only they are contributing into the writing business logic of the automation testing but they are also tweaking their own pipeline so they can run the automation test whenever they need on demand or or you know in the automated way load testing at night or non peak hours and all smoke or sanity testing whenever they need and all uh, so we are empowering them so i would say you bring the culture of this devops where you are being more collaborative and solving solving the problem for the uh, for your customer so understand your customer uh, i see generally people are coming in a devops from three different paths one is from the system engineering uh, system admin second is from build and releases linux admin maybe and then many people are coming from the developer mm. a developer background and i when i when i compare i always see the developers who are coming and joining the devops team they generally excel and they excel because of this particular reason where they are helping and they thinking from the developer mindset because that's where they are going to solve the problem the operation part is anyway either we are going to automate or we we are going to bring some tool which is going to reduce our operation cost operation overhead which is a really big burden to the companies if you'll start talking about people who always handling the big scale for example mpl i have seen hotstar i have seen they now want to cut down those because those people who are sitting there they now after a certain point of time or after certain number of people they themselves start creating problem in the system because of the manual tweaking and things what they are doing so they everybody wants to get rid of the the, the things me as a devops if i am doing the same thing repeating things more than twice and not automating it again that, 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 that's a, that's a culture i'm talking about yeah. so that's a very important key point i would say anybody who who is working the devops be please be understand your customers understand the develop, developer mindset and be there understand things understand your qa and also understand the business if you are into some leadership position you always has to think from the business perspective so that's a one collaboration is a one because as i said without collaboration you cannot move anything not a single needle you need a help from each and every every uh, departments who are consuming your services and the third is whenever we are planning and taking any decision this is again going from the business one always always have the roi calculation uh, without it and without a proper planning do not just jump into the decisions and and start doing it and i i have seen people do it because they see a trend uh for example okay jenkins just just an example i'm saying jenkins somebody heard and they they know about just jenkins because they heard they go and they just yeah you start utilizing jenkins without even thinking how jenkins is there any alternative do they have a competition chart 
because each and every situation is exactly different. No two situations are same. And that's why the solution which is working for situation A cannot work for the situation B. So you need to analyze the situation. You need to select the right tool. You need to calculate based on ROI. You need to have a comparison chart. And if you have art council, that's the best best platform for you to give a, a, a feedback, a honest feedback within the company. And then make a decision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a highly unlikely then that you will be making any bad decisions. Awesome, Abhishek. Thanks a lot. Thanks for sharing perspective on on-prem, hybrid, multi-cloud, and then uh, taking through us through the journey of cost, efficiency, reliability, and then building DevOps culture. Thanks for coming on this. And then... Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks. Thanks again for having me. I thoroughly enjoy it, and I, I hope our audience will also uh, get uh, many things. They get to learn many things. I would also encourage, like, if anybody needs to know more more about it or something in more details, feel free to, you know, uh, ping us. And, and I hope you will be happy to answer them. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.